this video will cover two-dimensional flow and flow mats. This is actually part one, we'll do part two as well on flow mats. So uh, before we go on to two-dimensional flow, what I want to do first is point out that for one-dimensional flow, we've actually been solving a second-order partial differential equation without even knowing it. So that's kind of cool. We can solve an equation on accident. So uh, we found that head loss is linear in a layer with uniform so in other words, the change in total head with depth for a vertical one-dimensional flow is constant within the soil layer, right? And we've been linearly interpolating total head um, at various points in our solutions of one-dimensional flow so far. Um, okay, but if we if we have this equation for the derivative with depth of total head equals a constant. We can differentiate both sides of that equation and arrive at the governing second order partial differential equation here. It's the second derivative of total head with respect to that is zero. And that's the one dimensional Laplace equation. Now, that's not really a formal de uh, derivation of the equation, right? I'm just showing you that what we've been doing so far is consistent with the second order PDE. So let's take a look real quick at the derivation. It's not a very difficult one. So here's a little layer of. Um, of thickness dz, right, infinitesimal thickness. And we have some flow coming up into that layer and some flow going out of the layer. And then we have our datum at some elevation such that the bottom of the layer, layer is at an elevation of z and the top of the, the layer is at a um, depth of z plus delta z, z plus dz, not depth, elevation relative to the data. So the, the flow going in is equal to the velocity of the water going in times the cross-sectional area A, which in this case we can represent A as just being equal to dx dy, right? So we have vertical flow velocity times dx dy is the inflow. Then the outflow is just equal to the flow velocity at the top of the layer times the cross-sectional area, which is going to be equal to the flow velocity at the bottom of the layer plus the change in flow velocity over the element height the partial derivative of that times the element thickness, right? So that's the vz plus uh, partial of vz with respect to dz times dz. Um, okay, so we have the flow rates of both positions. Now we know that the flow rate, um, the flow out minus the flow in has to be zero. If the element is not changing volume, right? The amount of flow going in has to equal the amount of flow going out. So we can subtract these two equations from each other. And what we end up with is dvz over dz is equal to zero. Now what we can do is invoke our definition of hydraulic gradient, right? The vertical flow velocity using Darcy's law is kz times iz. Uh, and of course, iz is just the partial derivative of total head with respect to depth. So we get vz is equal to kz times dh z dz. So I'm putting in a letter now, subscript on the head. We haven't had those subscripts before because we've just been doing one-dimensional flow and we knew the direction we were dealing with, so we just used h. Now that we're transitioning to two-dimensional flow, it's important to keep track of which direction the total head loss is happening in. So now if we substitute this uh, into this equation for vz, we simply get kz times dhz, the second derivative of dhz over dz is equal to zero. Uh, okay, now if hydraulic conductivity is a function of depth, this differential equation is a little difficult to solve, right? There may not be a, a closed form solution depending on the functional form of kz, but if k is constant, we can just move it over to the other side and get rid of it. So simply stated, dh, let me put the z back on here, dhz, the second derivative of hz over dz is equal to zero if uh, kz is the constant. So it turns out that this is the one-dimensional Laplace equation, right? There's the definition of it. So um, 1d, that's the equation we've been solved. Kind of cool, right? Uh, it turns out we can expand the Laplace equation to be multidimensional. So in two dimensions and three dimensions, we just simply add together the second derivatives. So the two-dimensional Laplace equation, we get kz times the second derivative of hz, plus kx times the second derivative of kx is equal to zero. Uh, again, if, if kz and kx are both constants and are equal to each other, we can simply divide them out and they go away, right? And 
that's that's actually the condition that will solve the most commonly. But we'll see too that horizontal permeability in soil is usually bigger than vertical permeability. So if these constants are not equal to each other and they're not constant, it makes the problem a little more complicated. And then extending to three dimensions, we just add a y term in there too, and we fully define the three-dimensional flow. So that's the three Laplace equation. Let's go back real quick and solve example 7.3 using the Laplace equation. You remember this example from a few videos ago right here. Uh, we have the data, and then there's these uh, points A through F at various elevations within this soil. So first, we have to state the problem. So here's the differential equation we're solving, second derivative of hz with respect to z is equal to zero. And we have to know some boundary conditions, right? This is a boundary value problem. So what we know is that the total head at point F at negative at an elevation of minus five is equal to zero, right? And the way we got that, the elevation head is negative five centimeters measured down from the data, and the pressure head is five centimeters measured down from the nearest water surface. So the total head is the sum of those two is equal to zero centimeters. Then we have the total head at point C. Okay, the elevation head is twenty centimeters. The pressure head is also twenty centimeters. So we add those together, we get forty centimeters. So now we've stated the differential equation that governs the problem we're trying to solve, and we've stated our boundary conditions. The only other important thing to remember is that the solution is valid only in the range from negative 5 to 20 centimeters. Okay, the solution is for this range within the soil, and we can't apply it up here in the water or down here in the spawner. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, now the form for a second um, derivative, uh, you know, a second order of P is a linear equation, so the form is hz equals a plus bz, and solving the equation is super simple, we just plug in our boundary conditions, and we get a system of equations, it's only two equations and two unknowns here, so the first equation at point f is this one, and then the equation at point c is that one, and we can solve um, that system of equations to get b is equal to 8 fifths, and a is equal to 8 centimeters. So we plug those in, and we get the equation here for total head within that soil area. So at any depth, we can plug in z, as long as we're in this domain where the soil is, and directly compute the, um, uh, the total head using this equation. So just to verify that this is the same as what we got before, here is the table of total head values from that equation at points c, d, e, and f. And you'll see, if you go back to that problem, these numbers are exactly the same as what we saw before using the interpolation. Um, okay, we can't use this equation to solve points A and B because they lie outside the domain. So when we did the previous problem, we also had points A and B in there. We don't do that now because the differential equation applies only within the soil. Alright, before we also solved the problem with layered soil, two different hydraulic conductivities. Um, we can do the differential equation approach easily enough for layered systems as well. It just gets to be a little more complicated. So we have to set up multiple domains and enforce continuity of total head at the layer interface. So for example, here's a system where we have two layers, and we would have uh, you know, this equation for the total head in layer one, and this equation for the total head in layer two. So you'll see that there's um, ranges here over which these equations are valid. Uh, then we would have to know the total head at the top of layer 1 and at the bottom of layer 2. And then, of course, at this interface between 1 and 2, the total head has to be equal within the layers, right? We can't have discontinuity in total head. So HZ1 is equal to HZ2, and Z equals H2. Uh, and then the other thing that we know is that the total head loss in the two layers is um, proportional to um, permeability ratio K2 over K1 and the height ratio of H1 over H2. So we can H2, so we can apply that and solve the problem no, no worries. Alright, let's move on now to flow nets. So um, a flow net is a graphical solution to the two-dimensional Laplace equation. So here's the 2D Laplace equation for constant hydraulic conductivity. And I should say the flow net assumes that the hydraulic conductivity is constant. And what we'll do in drawing the flow net is to sketch boundaries of the soil and the known water surface.
sentences, and we'll use deep for that since those are both known. Then the second step is to sketch flow lines that are parallel to the direction of water flow. So we anticipate the water flow is going to go in a certain direction. We sketch flow lines that are parallel to that direction. Um, and I should mention that this is iterative, so we're making a guess at what the flow lines are in step two. We're probably not going to draw them perfectly, so use a pencil, right? This is going to require some iteration and some erasing. Then the third step is that we sketch what are called equipotential lines. Those are lines of constant total head. And the equipotential lines have to intersect the flow lines at, at right angles. And then the spaces between the flow lines and equipotential lines have to be square. That means you have to be able to fit a circle into the little regions between flow lines and equipotential lines. Use the pencil for that, too, because you're going to make mistakes. Then step four, you have to adjust the flow lines and equipotential lines until you achieve a solution. So here's an example problem. I'm going to try and do this real quick. Um, I'm going to draw my um, flow lines and thin black uh, lines here. So anyway, we have I've drawn in thick lines all of the surfaces that we know. We have um, like a sheet pile here, and then we have water on one side of it. That water surface is known. Here's the ground surface on the left side, same as the ground surface on the right side, but the water level on the right side is lower. So we're getting seepage flowing underneath the sheet pile like that. So what I'm going to do now is try and draw flow lines. Uh, I'm going to start here. And again, you may be wondering why am I drawing them the way I'm drawing them. Well, I've done a few flow nets before, and I have some experience with this. So there's one, and then I'll draw little arrows to indicate the direction of flow. I'm just going to draw two flow lines. So let's draw a second one here. This has to be vertical, right? Flow lines have to intersect equi potential lines at um, right angles. So this surface up here is an equi potential line. All of the known boundaries are equi potential lines. Uh, okay, now I'm going to switch to my green pen and try and draw some uh, square equi potential lines. So, what I mean by square. I said you'd have to erase. So the equipotential line has to be perpendicular to the sheet pile and perpendicular to this flow line. And by square, I actually drew it a little too high. I'm going to draw it a little lower right there. What I mean is that you can fit a circle into this space. So that's a square region. Then we have to continue it down. Okay, this impermeable boundary is a flow line, right? Because if water were to flow down, it would have to flow right along that boundary and back up. So my equipotential line has to have a right angle here, right angle there, and a right angle there. And you can see that if I try to draw a circle in there, it's not quite working, right? So I have a mistake. This is not a perfect flow net. I'll keep going. It's actually really hard to draw a perfect flow net. So there's another equipotential line. Unfortunately, this problem is symmetric, so the right side should exactly resemble the left side. All right, and there's not a bad flow net. Yeah, I clearly have some regions, like this region is a little taller than it is wide, you can't fit a circle in it. This one's pretty good, not quite, maybe it's a little too wide and it's tall. So if I were really doing a careful job with this, I would go through and adjust these flow lines and equipotential potential lines and iterate until I can fit a perfect circle in every single one of them. And once I have that, then I have a graphical solution to the two-dimensional Laplace equation.